Okay, so I think we should get started. Uh, welcome to this virtual tutorial where we'll be uh, discussing a couple of ECSEs which have recently completed and, and the work they've been doing. So there's two presentations in this session. The first one from me, I'm uh, Adrian Jackson from EPCC. And then the second one will be uh, from my colleague, uh, Nick Brown, um, talking about a different ECSE uh, project. Uh, please do feel free to uh, ask questions either on the chat or just by talking to us uh, whilst uh, this is going on. Uh, just interrupt if there's nothing, if there's things you don't understand or if there's anything you want to ask. Um, and uh, this is, session is being recorded, so it'll be made available online uh, later in the week or maybe next week uh, once we've processed the recording, once we've got going. So if stuff you want to listen back to later, then you should be able to do that as well. So I'm going to start off talking about a, a project I did um, over the last couple of years, uh, an ECSE funded project. So this is funded by Archer uh, to do by the Archer uh, program to do optimization of uh, simulation codes. And in this case, we were working with a, a scientist called Sergio Campobasso from the University of Lancaster. And he has a CFD code called COSA. Um, and I should say I was doing this work in collaboration with a colleague of mine here at EPCC, Neil Offer, who I know is hanging around on this um, virtual tutorial as well. So uh, it wasn't all me this. And what we were looking at here particularly, so so COSA has been, uh, it's a CFD code. It's designed to be highly parallelizable. So it's, it's a multi-block, multi-grid code. So it's already got the main decomposition designed into it. You can split up your data into multiple blocks and distribute those out across MPI process, across cores, across nodes on Archer. It's actually a, slightly different kind of CFT application. It's a harmonic balance. So it's a frequency domain approach rather than a uh, pure time domain approach. Um, so we can distribute uh, blocks of grid points across, proce across processes, but we also have a number of harmonics inside each grid point, which we can also distribute the work from as well. And in the past, it's been parallelized with uh, MPI um, and also a hybrid version of it. So it was an MPI plus open MP version of it. Uh, that uh, the particular version has been designed to provide better uh, utilization of large numbers of resources. So because it's multi-block code, i.e. the simulation domain when you run it has a fixed number of blocks. It might be a thousand blocks, it might be 10,000 blocks. Uh, the pure MPI code just distributes those blocks across processes. So if you've got a thousand blocks in your simulation and your input file, then you can use at most a thousand MPI processes. Uh, and the hybrid version of the code is designed to get around this by, by letting you use more cores than you have blocks by distributing um, each block to an MPI process, and then that can generate some threads to work on it as well. Uh, and, and in the past, this little graph here on this slide uh, was sort of measuring uh, energy usage for a um, number of nodes used, and, and we could get quite good performance on architectures like the blue gene, where we had hyper threading uh, on each call uh, by, by using this hybrid mode. But that's not what this uh, work was primarily about. Um, this work was primarily to move from this situation where we have the COSA code, it's parallelized, it's also got a hybrid version, and it can scale quite well. So this graph, a little bit hard to read, but, but we're just showing parallel scaling of different versions of the code, um, uh, the hybrid code by, versus the M pure MPI code for, for a given use case. Uh, and we don't have to worry too much about it, but, but the important thing here from our perspective was that you could run for this simulation, you could run up to about 4,000 blocks on the MPI code with perfect scaling. And when you go above the 4,000 blocks, it gets a little bit worse. Um, and you can push that out further if you go to the hybrid code, but we can see that the pure MPI performance is really quite good until we get up to a point where we don't have enough work to distribute all the processes. 
but this is benchmarking that's done without IO. So without we read an input file in at the beginning, but we don't record the time to write the data out at the end, which is which is quite common with IO. These are the same kind of um, simulations, but now what we're doing is we're looking at the performance of the code without IO, and we increase the number of cores, the number of MPI processes we use in. This is a pure MPI code. And then we turn the output IO on and, and see what that does to us. And we can see that for this graph in the bottom left corner, we've got a large test case here. We're running up to 16,000 cores, 16,000 MPI processes. If we don't have the IO turned on, that's the red dots, then we can get performance, which, which is very close. Uh, this is a log, log plot, so um, not I, not perfect, but very close to the purple dots, which are uh, perfect scaling. However, if we run the same code, but turn the IO on, then we can see the blue dots of the performance we get compared to the to the ideal case. So it's a lot, lot slower when we write our data out from the simulation and write our checkpoint files out, the scaling is nowhere near as good. Now, and the same is true for top right graph, except the top right graph is a small test case using small numbers of cores. Um, there is a, still a difference there between the um, red dots and the blue dots, and that is our cost of doing our IO. It doesn't look as big because we're on a log uh, plot, but it is still quite, an, a, quite a, a big difference, almost an order of magnitude difference in the performance. Now, it should be pointed out that these are extreme uh, versions of our problem here because what we've done is we've run a simulation. We haven't done many computational uh, steps. We haven't done many iterations. We've just run a simulation for 100 iterations and we've written all the data out at the end. If you were running in full production, then you'd have more work to do, more iterations to do before you write your data out, before you write your checkpoint files out or your your output files. So it wouldn't look quite as bad as this for a normal run of the code, but we were looking at, you know, trying to isolate the real cost of doing the IO here. So that's what we get here. And uh, and we can see it more clearly if we if we look at the profiling. Um, so this is the small test case running on 100 processes and the small test case running on 800 processes. And we can see that when we scale up from 100 to 800 processes, that the MPI time goes from being about 20% of the overall runtime to about 40% of the overall runtime. And we can see that the IO part of the MPI file write goes from about 5% up to about 25-30%. Um, I mean, this barrier here, this MPI barrier, we don't have a barrier in the code. So I think we think this is coming out of the MPI. Uh, IO stuff as well um, at this point. So we can see that the MPI communications, the MPI wait any, has stayed about the same going from 100 to 800 processes. It stayed about, in, in terms of overall runtime, about 10% of the, of the runtime of this code is, is the uh, overhead of sending messages between processes, but the IO is getting um, a lot worse. So we recognize this is a problem and the whole point of the the project was to was to optimize this. Um, now, ideally, we would so the, the code already does parallel I/O, so it writes its data out using MPIO, which which should be the way of giving us good performance. Uh, ideally, we'd want to use this thing called um, collective uh, MPIO, which is where every process writes uh, does their I/O at the same time and the same number of IO operations. And, and this is some benchmark data that uh, a colleague of mine, uh, David Henting, and others did on um, Archer a, a few years ago. So there's a white paper up on the Archer website talking about IO performance. And, and if you do collective IO with a large number of processes, you can get really quite good IO performance. So you can, you can get up towards what you'd expect to be the peak performance of our file systems on Archer. Uh, certainly on the top left hand side that's what we get so that's what we would like to do it be able to do um however the way the code is structured uh each each uh, mpi process has a, a number of blocks that it does its simulations on and we try and make that number of blocks that you're running on um 
as uh, consistent as possible. So each process has the same number of blocks, but because we want the code to be flexible, we don't enforce that you have to have the same number of blocks. We try and do a decomposition where we spread the work out evenly, but we don't necessarily always have the same number of blocks. And each block may be slightly different size. So the block is defined in the input file, um, the user generates that for their simulation and we don't restrict what they do with that. So blocks could all be the same size or they could all be different sizes. And that makes it difficult for us to do this collective IO where everybody's doing the same IO at once. Not impossible. Um, we could actually do this by creating um, MPI data types which match onto our blocks and then at every IO operation, we just write one of these data types for each block and, and it, it, it could be done in collective, but it was uh, something that was a, a, a reasonable amount of work and we never uh, managed to get around to. So, we, so the IO uh, is using parallel IO, but it's a non-collective version of the MPI um, IO stuff. Um, and also when the IO was first implemented, I can say this because it was me who did it uh, prior to this project, it wasn't done in the most efficient way possible. Primarily because when we were doing that, we were porting this code from Fortran, from serial to parallel, and we wanted to be able to replicate exactly how it did the IO in the first place so that we could do a binary comparison between the files it produced in parallel and the files it produced in serial and make sure they were exactly the same. Um, that was doing Fortran binary format files. Um, and that is a slightly strange format where it doesn't just write the data to the file. It also, each line it writes, it writes the number of bytes at the beginning of a line and the number of bytes at the end of a line and then moves on. And so to replicate this in MPIO, we had to add in these byte writes, these size writes. So we had to write three times for each line rather than just writing a, a line out at, at once. Um, and the uh, IO was also being done um, to avoid writing the halos of the, of the data arrays. So the data arrays have halos around them to, to enable the MPI communications, but those halos don't have useful data when it comes to writing the file. Uh, and of course, the serial application didn't have halos in its blocks. So when we were writing out this data, particularly the restart data, we were uh, doing a large number of writes so we could skip over these halos and effectively we were writing a line at a time and leaving off the edges of the, the halos, um, writing them out to a file. So uh, that was for the restart file and for the the actual data files, we were also writing some metadata out as well. So uh, these these uh, files, which meant it could be written by tech plot uh, and easily plotted up. Um, and that involved translating something at the top here, which is what the Fortran looked like, into something at the bottom here, which you won't be able to read, but basically is a large number of MPI writes to, to write all these individual parts of this metadata out before we actually get on to write in the actual data out, which is here where we pack our data into a temporary array and then write it out as a single file. So our, our first operation was to um, try and move away from that. Um, and um, instead of writing out, instead of trying to avoid writing these halos out, in fact, we'll just write the whole data set out. Um, and restructure the reading back in of this data um, to ignore the halos. Or in fact, actually, it doesn't matter because uh, if we, this is writing the restart file, we write the halos out. It doesn't matter if there's rubbish in them because when we read them back in, we're not going to use them. We're going to reinitialize them from some MPI communications anyway. So we could get rid of this top loop where we were doing uh, X, well, uh, J times K times something, number of writes. Uh, and do it effectively in a single write for, for each harmonic uh, element in our simulation. But, you no, know, we're still here putting in this, um, we're writing the number of bytes at the beginning and end of each file, so that's still matching the Fortran, um, Fortran binary file format. Um, and doing that let us 
uh, strip out some of that costs. So we uh, now improve the performance from the blue dots down to the green dots. So blue dots, um, sorry, not from the blue dots. Yeah, okay. Uh, annoyingly, my graphs have got uh, reversed colors. So on the bottom left graph here, it's the blue dot is the original code, the green dot is the optimized IO, then the red dots are the original code with no IO. And then on the top right hand graph, we have uh, the red dot is the original code and the green dot is the updated IO and the blue dot is where we want to be. So we can see we're still nowhere near uh, the performance without doing the IO uh, at all, but we have a uh, cutback cost of doing the, the writing the data out. And of course, because we're only doing small simulations here, small numbers of iterations, this is very much a, a you know a large amount of IO cost compared to the actual computational cost, which is not what you would see in in, in real practice. Um, and then we also were able to do some other work in there. So uh, taking so the IO code was actually split into two halves, where it ran a routine which went through all the data and computed some values was going to output from that data, stored that into a temporary array, then went into the I.O. routines and then wrote that out. And we were able to merge those two things together. So it calculated what it wanted to write out on the fly whilst it was doing the I.O. Get rid of that sort of process of running through memory and then rerunning through memory again. Uh, interestingly enough as well, we were also seeing an issue where when we were reading data in at the beginning of a program, we were starting to see significant slowdowns. So our, our IO input, uh, reading the mesh file that uh, we we're going to use, um, wasn't parallelized. Uh, what we were actually doing was each 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 process would just find its place, its place for its blocks in the file, and then just read that data out in serial using using standard um, Fortran serial IO operations, and that works fine. But once you start getting up to 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 processes, uh, what's happening is every time a process reads from the file, it locks it. It reads its data, it unlocks it, and the next one locks it, reads the data, and unlocks it. Even though we're not updating the file, there's still some file locking going on there. And that can be quite costly um, at large, large core counts. I mean, it's only done once. It's only done at the beginning of the simulation, but it's still an overhead. So we, we converted that into um, MPIIO, so we do parallel reading at that point as well. Um, and we were able to improve the performance a little bit more there as well. So uh, we, we we cut the, um, we go down from the green to the, to the purple dot, dots there now as well. So um, effectively, what we've managed to do is just re reduce the number of MPIIO calls we're doing, um, write out more data than we need, but to do that, do do that to reduce the number of MPIO calls we're doing, uh, because each one of those MPIO calls, because we're not doing this collective operation, it involves updating your look where you are in the file, writing your data, then moving on to the next point in the file and writing your data. So if we can cut down the number of calls we're doing, we can we can improve our performance. The other thing that we were interested in doing, the users were interested in doing, was seeing if some of the other IO formats that are out there would be usable in the parallel application. So we're writing MPIO to binary files. That's fine, but in reality, the, the grid files that are used in the simulation come from commercial grid generators or other software, which will output it in a certain format. And then any results we produce will be analyzed in other packages, which tend to read standardized formats, such as uh, CGNS and tech plot formats. Um, so uh, the particular users for this code were interested in seeing, could we read or write data in tech plot format and CGNS format um, directly from the relation and what kind of performance would that give? Um, so CGNS is built on HDF5. Um, and it has parallel functionality in it. So, it. so you should be able to read and write data in parallel. Uh, you won't be able to read this particularly well, but 
but there's a there's a set of functions you can call to set up your file to set up your metadata and then to write your data to read your data it's a little bit more involved than doing mpio but but, but you could argue also more user friendly uh, because because it's got specific metadata and uh, and more understandable functions in there um, and you can write your data um, out as well uh, unfortunately the cgns stuff um, isn't fast enough for us to use in parallel at the moment so even though it's going down to hdf5 um, if we compare reading and writing a, a 40 gigabyte file from 512 processors in MPIO, we can do it in a, a matter of seconds. Um, in CGNS, writing the file takes about six, you know, five or six hundred seconds, and reading it in still takes about two or three hundred seconds. So, whilst we have the functionality there, but it doesn't make any sense to use it in the parallel application because it will take slow. And so, the question was, why is this? Um, it's actually, I think, a, a design issue. CGNS and, and these other formats are not really don't seem to be really designed for uh, applications which have lots of uh, a large number of blocks in them. They seem to be designed for applications where they have a single block which is split up across processors internally. So because we've got here say about sixteen thousand blocks, the metadata operations of setting up each of those blocks and writing the data to it. Even though we can do that very fast in MPIO, those metadata operations are destroying that performance in the CGNS stuff. Um, so that's why it's going through slowly. Um, tech plot is a very similar thing. So, uh, but they have a number of different formats you can use. You can use a, an ASCII format, but that's legacy, and a binary PLT format, and a parallel PLT format called uh, SZ plot. Um, and it looks quite similar to writing things in the CGNS stuff. Um, unfortunately, we can implement this, but the the serial version, the PLT stuff, um, if you compare the performance to the parallel version, the serial uh, way of writing it that they have is about 10 times as fast as the, the parallel way of writing it. So there's some kind of issue at, uh, again, with the tech plot stuff, but it's just too slow to, for us to do the parallel I/O into it. And I think again, it's based around this single block versus multiple block things. Um, now, tech plot have just released a new version of this functionality, which they assure me this performance uh, issue is fixed in. But w last time I checked, it was still given the same issue. So there's a little bit of work there, which we'll, we'll continue to do to have a look at that and see if. Um, we can optimize it there. So um, what we did instead is we wrote some converters which would take the MPIO version data once you produce it and turn it into uh, tech plot format or turn it into CGNS format. And likewise, you could read in data in tech plot format or CGNS format and, and turn it into a binary file which could be used as input to one of these things. And we can do it offline. And it may take quite a while, but we're not using the parallel resources of Archer or a similar kind of system when we're doing that. And then the next thing we would like to do, but it's beyond this project, is see if we can then put this collective MPIO stuff in so that we are not using all these individual MPIO operations. Uh, we're going straight to the collective. So if we can do that. We just need to write the MPI data types, which will match onto the blocks um, to do that. A uh, little bit of work, but it's, it should be doable. Uh, now, that was the I.O. side. As I say, if you've got any questions, just jump in and, and ask me or put something in the chat. Or you can even apparently raise your hand in this software. So um, just let me know. Uh, the other one which I won't talk very much about, but I'll briefly mention is the other part of this project was to do some load balancing work. So all those blocks we talked about distributing across MPI processes to do our parallelization. Um, what we basically do is if you have an input file, it's got a thousand blocks in it we, and you're running on 500 processors, we just divide a thousand by 500 and give each MPI process two blocks and they work on that. It's a pretty simple thing to do. If you have 
a number of blocks which doesn't exactly divide by the number of processes, we can still deal with that. Some will have slightly more numbers of blocks and some will have slightly less. However, this relies on somebody creating those blocks and making sure that those blocks themselves are as similar as possible in the amount of work. Otherwise, because the way we give the blocks out, we give people the same number of blocks. If each one of those blocks has a different amount of work in them, we'll have a load balance problem. Some processes will have more work to do than others. And actually, um, if we look at this example here, this is an example simulation where we've created a, we've taken a, an output of a grid generator and not done any work to optimize the splitting of that into blocks, just taking the blocks they gave us. And here you can have a, a difference in block size of something like six to one. So some blocks can be six times bigger than others. And then when we run this on a whole range of process counts, these blue dots here, we can see that we're not getting anywhere near the performance of the red dots, which would be ideal scaling, because we've got load balance issues, because we've not got good distribution of uh, equal amounts of work to processes. So what we wanted to do, um, and this is uh, a lot of work when Neil Offer did, was to say, actually, okay, can we take an unbalanced block decomposition where lot blocks are very different in size uh, so that it's easy to take a, a simple uh, output of a, a grid generator or, or something like that. We don't have to do a lot of work. Someone doesn't have to do a lot of manual work in, in balancing these things. Can we take that, do some work inside the code to make sure to distribute those blocks evenly uh, and then run in, in series. So what we use there is, uh, is the Metis package, uh, which which will take all the block data and then try and uh, give out the, the blocks to processes to make sure that they are you have even amount of work. Now to do this, you have to have uh, more blocks than you have processes. So you know you have to have twice as many blocks as you're trying to run on processes. But as long as you do that, um, then we can take that into account. Uh, and that turned out to be really quite um, efficient. So the top uh, blue line uh, dots are the original code, original decomposition, and the red dots are the ideal performance based on that original decomposition. And then our green and blue dots at the bottom are our same simulation, same blocks, but distributed in a more sensible way using Metis to decide how to split them up. And we can see we can get uh, really quite big performance improvements when we're doing these unbalanced uh, decomposition so it can go um, really three or four times faster at various uh, process counts by um, taking into account differences in work here and actually the nice thing about it is we can also uh, instead of having to choose a MPI process count which e e exactly divides the number of blocks we have we can use random MPI process counts 48 72 and still get quite good performance, which means we can fill up our nodes on Archer and still become quite efficient. Um, and so putting these two things together means we can make the um, program much easier for the users so they can just take input files and easily run them um, without having to do lots and lots of specialized work to make sure they're load balanced. The program will just do it for them. And we've also improved the I.O. performance by uh, quite a significant amount. So, so up to about 70% less cost in the I.O. for large core counts for the tests we are running. Uh, and hopefully these two things together can make it more performant in Archer, but also easier to use going forward. OK, so. Anton's asked me a question about uh, NetCDF versus MPIO. Um, so, and he's saying that he's seen 10 times slower on Archer between NetCDF, HDF5, and MPIO. Um, and that maybe there was some issue with NetCDF and HDF5 on Archer. No, I remember this, Anton, that, that was true. Um, the benchmarking we've done recently we see uh, net CDF and HDF5 much closer performance to MPIO. Um, so I can point you at that. We're doing some continuous integration benchmarking of, of um, bench IO results across time. 
and net CDF and HDF5 are slower than MPIO, but they're the same order of magnitude uh, most of the time now. So I, I think this is not the issue that we see here going to CGNS or, or um, tech plot. Um, so I think that has been fixed. Okay, so um, please, if you've got any questions, let me know. But I'm also um, aware that I'm eating into Nick's time for his presentation now as well. So if you've got any questions, do shout out. Otherwise, I will hand over to um, Nick to talk about Monk. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Let me just bring up my... Um, slides okay so hopefully everybody can hear me if if you can't just ping something into the chat window um so yeah so my name's nick i'm from epcc and i'm going to be talking to you about some of the work i've done as one of the other ecse projects and this was looking at an atmospheric model and specifically what i'm going to be talking about here is experiences our work developing in situ data analytics and um, how we've engineered it, how our users interact with the, um, with the analytics, some challenges we've faced and solutions to those, um, as well as some discussion about performance and scalability. So before I begin, I'll give you a little bit of background. So um, the model itself, the atmospheric model is called Monk. And this is a model used by weather and climate communities for modeling cloud and the atmosphere. Now, this was initially developed um, as part of a JWPRC grant, and then we had an ECSE to um, develop further bits of it, including the analytics, adding features and optimizing it. Now, the model itself replaces a much older model from the 1980s, and the older model could only deal with about 20 million global grid points, wouldn't scale beyond a couple of hundred cores. Whereas this new model, Monk, we can deal with billions of grid points and run on many tens of thousands of cores. Um, but some causes challenges are related to this. And specifically the challenge I'm talking about here is to do with data analytics. Because users aren't all that interested in the raw prognostic data which is the illustration on the left of this slide, effectively all the values at every point in the grid, because there's billions of them, as I say. In terms of this can easily be many gigabytes, if not terabytes of data. Instead, the users, the scientists, are far more interested in higher level information, such as what's the average temperature at every level in the atmosphere, and how does that change over time? So as part of this model, what we needed to do was not only the computational side of things, but also analyze this raw data to generate this higher level diagnostic values to, um, to produce this view that the scientists really want. And I suppose there's a number of different ways of doing this. So one way we could do it is just write all the raw data to disk every time step and then analyze it offline. Well, I think um, in terms of performance, that would be a real um, nightmare. It would require lots and lots of file system space as well. So we discounted that pretty quickly. The previous model that we replaced, what they did is in line with computation, after every time step, they stopped the simulation. They then um, analyzed the data, the cores would communicate, write to file, and then continue the computation at the next time step. And even with a small number of cores, a couple of hundred cores, that was the limit of this previous model, that showed real issues when it came to performance and scalability. So instead, and I think it was the right choice for us to make, we adopted this in situ approach where cores are shared. And they're shared between computation and data analytics. So typically what we have in a processor is one core doing data analytics, servicing the remaining cores doing computation. And these asynchronously fire and forget their data to their corresponding data analytics core, which will then process the data, potentially communicate with other data analytics cores, maybe do some IO. But whilst it's doing that, the computational cores can literally carry on on the next time step and um, doing more simulation. So squirting the data over, fire and forget, 
without having to block for analytics or file IO. Now, this is called the IO server pattern. In itself, it's not a hugely new idea. So I suppose a big question would be, well, why on earth did we develop our own implementation of this? Why on earth did we come and do this ourselves? But whilst there are a number of existing approaches out there, actually none of them met the requirements that we needed. I mean, for instance, XIOS was the most serious contender here. And initially, we did quite a few um, prototypes of coupling XIOS with Monk. But the problem with XIOS is it doesn't support dynamic time stepping. And that's where the size of the time step changes from time step to time step. And as I'll talk about in more detail in a few slides time, actually that causes us quite a few headaches. But there's other things as well in terms of we need to be able to checkpoint and restart not just the state of the data analytic of the uh, computation, but also the data analytics. We need bit reproducibility, obviously scalability and performance, but also we need to enable our users, the scientists, to be able to configure and potentially extend the, uh, the analytics as easily as possible. Now, broadly speaking, the scientists, the users, fall into three different categories. We have people who are very knowledgeable, typically know Fortran, and want to go in and modify the code and add different analytics at the code level. We have users that don't really want to go in at the code level, but still want to configure things, maybe a higher level, but still have lots of control. And then we have the third group that really just want to take things off the shelf and just use directly without having to worry too much about the, uh, the specifics of the configuration. So our overarching um, data pipeline or architecture is this. And there's three main features here. So the first feature is this external API. So this is getting raw data in from our computational cores into the um, IO server, into this data analytics code. The next feature is this diagnostics federator, and this is actually what physically does the data analytics. And then the third feature is this writer federator, and this writes the analyzed data and potentially any raw data to file. And actually, this is the user's view, if you like, of the architecture around these three main areas, and this is where they focus their configuration. So just to give you a very brief flavor of this, um, in terms of configuring data that will be sent from a Monk computational core into the I.O. server, it looks like something um, at the bottom of this slide, this XML configuration, where we have different parcels of raw data which are sent over at uh, different points, different frequency of time steps. So, for instance, here we're sending a couple of raw data fields over every other time step, and you can have many different um, different parcels of um, raw data fields. And so when the simulation starts and computational cores register with their corresponding I.O. server, they're just told what data needs to be sent over when and they'll just do it. In terms of the actual data analytics, the second part, it looks something like this, again, at the bottom of the slide. So what we're saying here is we're producing a diagnostic field, a data analyzed field. Here it's called VWP mean. And in order to generate this, there's a whole load of different rules that need to be executed. Now, these rules typically are operators, such as arithmetic, maybe slicing fields up, or communications. For instance, finding global sums, global minimums, global maximums, etc. And the way that these work is each of these rules will take in either raw data fields and or intermediate results. And they produce either intermediate results or a final diagnostic field, in this case, VWP mean. And when the IO server starts up, it does some dependency analysis to figure out which can run concurrently and which have to run before other rules. And specifically with these operators, that's where the scientists, the users can go in and add in extra operators because they all follow common uh, Fortran interface where they can define their own things and plug them in here and then they have access to them um, like so. So the third feature 
um, this writer federator, so that's where we actually physically write stuff to disk, that's a bit more complicated because not only are we doing the writing to disk, but we also manipulate fields in time. And what I mean by that is in the output file, the scientists aren't so interested in terms of every single diagnostic value. Instead, they're much more interested in values at specific points in model time. And these can either be instantaneous um, values. So for instance, um, a snapshot of value, um, for instance, every 10 model seconds, ignoring every other contribution, every other value, or alternatively, time averaged values. So that's where you might produce, for instance, a value at every 10 model seconds, but it's an average of all the contributions within that time period. And this is actually what's then physically written to file. And this is just a flavor of how the scientists configure this. You know, what they're saying is a file name with a right time frequency. So this is at every 100 model seconds, this will be written out. And then a load of fields or groups of fields which are manipulated in time different ways. Um, and then these produce time values at specific model frequencies. Now, this is where um, the fact that we have a dynamic time step really causes headaches. Because, for instance, with this VWP mean field, what we're saying is we're going to produce a time averaged value every two model time steps. And eventually, this will all be written out after 100 model seconds. So, naively, we might say 100 over 2, OK, the time dimension is 50. But actually, because of the dynamic time stepping, we have no idea if this is true or not. You know, for instance, we might get a value at 0.1 seconds, 0.2 seconds, 0.3 seconds. That's great. These are all contributing to this first time averaged value. But then suddenly, the next value is at 20 model seconds. So we've jumped over lots and lots of these points. So instead, actually, the size of this time dimension, instead of 50, might instead be, I don't know, 25, 32, 38, who knows? And we have no idea about this size until it actually comes to the right point, to the, the point in which we're writing the file, and then we know the size of the, um, the dimensions. I mean, we use NetCDF, but unfortunately, we can't use the, use the unlimited time dimension here, um, and that's because we're using independent rights. So instead, what we need to do is we have to store stuff as it's produced. And then only when we've gone beyond this right point do we know that. We know all the stuff we've stored is to be written. And then we can figure out the size of these time dimensions. But it's a bit of a pain. I suppose the last thing I would say from a configuration perspective in terms of the user's interaction is we also allow, especially uh, novice users, do a lot of reuse of configuration. So with the model, we've produced a whole load of templates, if you like, pre-configured pre diagnostics and other things like checkpointing that they can literally just include and then use directly. And my background is as a C programmer, hence we've got this C preprocessor directive approach. But it's just to enable them to, um, to use stuff that's pre-packaged for novice users. And we also have a, conflict, um, a concept of namespaces. Initially, um, there was quite a bit of conflict between these different things. So optionally, uh, the users in their configuration can specify namespaces to keep things self-contained, to keep variable names, etc., private. So that's the um, configuration side of things. And as I say, if you have any questions as I'm going on, feel free to pop them in the chat window, or uh, as Adrian said, raise your hand. Now, what I want to do in a little bit more detail is talk about the implementation or the engineering side of things and how we've designed or architected this. Because what we figured out after a couple of attempts is actually far the easiest way of doing this was to make each federator and each sub-activity to the federator an event handler. So following the event-based coordination pattern. So effectively, all of these wait for input events, which could be data or could be events from other event handlers. And so what happens when an event arrives at a handler is it then grabs a thread from the pool, which then will be kicked off to process that event. So within an event handler, potentially there's many different threads processing different events concurrently at the same time. 
And actually, that's exactly what we want. It's to aid asynchronous data handling, to get as much happening concurrently as possible, to get data flowing through it and being processed. Where we found this raised a real challenge, though, was in terms of bit reproducibility. Because suddenly, when you enable this concurrency, this asynchronicity, actually, you lose, if you're not careful, the um, ordering of events being processed. And for some cases, especially when we're manipulating in time, this causes us problems. Because if fundamentally, what that's doing is floating point arithmetic, and obviously, the order of floating point arithmetic matters. So, for some of these event handlers, what we do is we enforce predictable ordering of events based upon the um, time step metadata associated with that event. So for instance, if you get an event at model time step one, then two, then three, that's great. But then suddenly we get one at model time step five without having the preceding one, well, we might then queue that up until the preceding event has been received, processed, and then we can take these others from the queue and then work on them in order. There's an impact in terms of performance in doing that, so we only enforce this ordering with a subset of these event handlers, but it's a way we found which was important for specific areas to uh, enable bit reproducibility. Another real challenge we found was in terms of these inter-IO communications. So this is sitting underneath the Diagnostics Federator, and typically this is for doing data analytics, when we're figuring out global sums, global maximums, minimums, etc. Now, very naturally, what you'd want to use is MPI collectives, such as MPI reduction. But the problem here is the issue order matters with these. So, for instance, if an I.O. server does an MPI reduction for field A and then field B, then absolutely every other I.O. server has to do it in that same order. If another I.O. server, for instance, did a reduction for field B, and then field A, I did them in the wrong order, then you get an error. And most dangerously, it'd be a silent error and the value would just be wrong. So a challenge we faced was how to enable this asynchronicity, keeping these different IO servers as independent as possible, but still not falling foul of this. And the solution that we decided to adopt was to implement a lower level active messaging layer in our IO server. So what this is, is all our inter-IO communications effectively call in to this lower level active meshing layer that we've implemented. And when they're doing their communications, not only do they send the data and the metadata, but they also send a unique identifier, which will match them together rather than the issue order, and additionally a callback subroutine. And this is then called by a thread on the route when the final communication result is determined. Now, to give you an example of this, at the bottom of the slide, what we've got here is this inter-IO reduction. We've got our metadata, and then we've got the field name concatenated with the time step, that's our unique identifier, and then this handler subroutine is the callback. So this is a non-blocking call. Different IO servers will call this and then just crack on. And then on the route, which in this case is IO server zero, then once the communication is being completed, a thread will wake up and will call directly into this handler subroutine with the data provided and the metadata to process it. And it just means that we promote the asynchronous nature that we want in our IO server, but also without at the higher level of our event handlers having to worry about lots of different request handles, checking them and deal with them, because we're just pushing all this down into the lower level active messaging layer which we found actually worked very well for us. Where this actually also helped, and we didn't realize initially until we started doing some optimization profiling, was in terms of avoiding excessive um, weighting and synchronization. Because we use NetCDF for write, uh, file writing, but crucially, this isn't thread safe. So when a thread of um, an IO server process calls into NetCDF, it has to, with a mutex, lock it, so no other thread within that process can be calling NetCDF at the same time. Now, because we use MPI-IO underneath NetCDF, when we run in thread serialized mode, we also need to protect MPI as well. 
So whilst there's a file operation being performed, no other thread in the I.O. server can do file writing or MPI operations. And this became a real issue for us because a number of NetCDF calls are collective and blocking. You know, for instance, the close call on a file, when an I.O. server calls this close call, it will then wait, blocked, until every other I.O. server um, calls that corresponding close. And whilst it's waiting for every other I.O. server, it can't then in any other threads do file writing or MPI um, communications. And because different I.O. servers are asynchronous and independent, we found there to be quite a large drift in terms of some of them might be waiting excessively in this core, blocking for other um, I.O. servers to catch up. Active meshing really helps us here because instead uh, we change it to call this um, into I.O. barrier call. So again, this is non-blocking. When we want to do a close, we call this and then just carry on. And only when every single I.O. server has done a corresponding into I.O. barrier, will they all then have a thread, wake up, call this close handler subroutine, and then actually call the specific NetCDF close subroutine itself. So pretty much then at the same time, they're all doing this blocking call rather than having to do all this excessive waiting, um, which was the previous approach. So this made a big, um, a big impact for us and really helped us. Um, so another challenge we faced was in the checkpointing side of things. And I'm not just talking about checkpointing the computational parts of the model, but also being able to checkpoint and restart the data analytics side of things. And this was a challenge because of all the asynchronicity, all the non-determinism, doing the diagnostics in this active meshing layer, and we had to really scratch our heads to figure out the best way of doing this. Now, we rely on two facts for this. Firstly, the fact that the writer federates, the physical writing, is far more deterministic than the diagnostic side of things. But also, crucially, we can ask the writer federator a specific question. And that is, up to a specific point in model time, do you have all the data, all the fields you need for that point in model time? So based upon that, when it comes to uh, checkpointing the state of the I.O. server, we will effectively wait until the writer federator has all the uh, field values, has all the data it needs at the point of that checkpoint. Line. The diagnostics federator has done all of its work up to that point. And only at that point does the writer federator and its sub-activities uh, get serialized and the state of them stored without having to worry about the state of anything else because we can then restart that um, without having to worry about um, any of the values because they're beyond what we're going to restart. And I mean, very briefly, the way we do this is a two-step process to firstly figure out the amount of memory we need, we then allocate that, and then we serialize into that and write it out. And again, that seems to work um, fairly well for us and, um, and solves the challenges of checkpointing. The last challenge I want to briefly mention, and it actually um, relates to something that Adrian talked about in his talk, and that's to do with writing out very large data sizes. Because in addition to these diagnostic or analyzed data fields, periodically the users do want to write out the raw or prognostic data, either for checkpointing and also for provenance as well. Now, exactly as Adrian said before, independent writes are pretty inefficient. And what we did initially was we said, okay, every I.O. server has a whole load of computational cores registered with it. So when it comes time to write out one of these prognostic fields, well, we'll just do a whole load of independent writes. Yes, they'll be fairly big, but that's fine. We'll just write these independently, job done. But actually, it was super, super, super slow. Really, really bad performance. I was getting lots of complaints about it. And actually, the only way of getting this to an acceptable level was to move over to collective rights and specifically to perform a minimal number of collective rights. So what we do, we start up when every computational core is registered with its corresponding I.O. server. That I.O. server will then search the global domain and specifically it's searching to try and um, produce the smallest possible number of contiguous big chunks 
that its own computational cores are contributing to. So for instance, in this example here, as an I.O. server, I have six computational cores, each with um, their own chunk, and I can make two big um, contiguous blocks. Um, first block, chunk C, D, E, and F, and the second block, chunk A and B. So in fact, I can do two big collective writes instead of lots of independent writes. And I say this had a massive, massive impact on the performance. You know, I'm talking about 100 times faster in terms of um, writing these uh, fields out. It was that significant uh, to do. So what I want to move on to now, is the last thing I'm going to talk about in this talk, is just a brief discussion in terms of the performance and the scalability based upon the optimizations I've talked about, the implementation I've talked about, and obviously the configuration and our architecture. So what we have here is one of our standard Monk test cases, and this is looking at Stratus Cloud, and we're doing weak scaling on Archer um, with a, a local grid size of 65,000 points. So at the largest runs, which is 32,000 cores, we've got 2.1 billion global grid points here. Now in blue, this is the runtime for computation only. So diagnostics in blue. In Stripey Red, Stripey Red, sorry, what we've done is we've enabled diagnostics. And the way in which we've done this is we've still kept with 32,000 computational cores, but effectively we've added in a whole load of additional, about 3,000 data analytics cores. So within each processor of Archer, one core doing data analytics, servicing the remaining 11 computational cores. So in fact, in the stripy red, 32,000 computational cores, overall, we have about 36,000 cores with the remainder doing data analytics. And you can see there is a slight impact to enabling data analytics. It's about 2% impact on the runtime out at 32,000 cores. But certainly that's much, much better than it was before we did all the optimizations. And it's currently within an acceptable level, but there are a few uh, bits of further work we could do, which I think will bring us down, which I'll talk about in a few moments at the end of the talk. Now, throughout this work, in terms of analyzing and trying to come up with some metrics for figuring out how well or how bad our data analytics are, I've adopted this IO overhead metric. And this is the runtime from the first um, Monk computational core sending a data value over that will actually physically start the write to that specifically write, specific write being done, completed, job done, can forget about it. And what you can see here, um, the graph on the left, is this is the overhead for um, the previous slides uh, runs, and it's about eight seconds, just over eight seconds for 32. Thousand, um, thousand computational cores. Tried a whole load of different configurations. Um, running in MPI serialized mode, thread serialized mode, where we protect MPI ourselves, is by far better than running in MPI thread multiple mode. And now that might sound obvious because it's well known that thread multiple mode isn't that good, but thread serialized mode, us protecting it ourselves, is actually very coarse grained, especially when it comes time to do these NetCDF file operations. So I was actually quite surprised that thread multiple mode is still so bad in comparison. But also for us as well, um, enabling hyperthreading is better than no hyperthreading for the IO server. Probably not a huge surprise because we've got lots and lots of concurrency, lots of threads, not particularly computationally intensive, so they can take advantage of the hyperthread. The last performance graph I'll show is just uh, very briefly something that we did on Archer KNL. So this is the same Stratus test case, but we've locked in um, 3 million grid points approximately um, globally. And on the horizontal axis, this is the ratio of um, computational cores to IO servers. So for instance, one is one to one, where we have 32 computational cores, 32 IO servers. Two is two to one, so we have thir uh, 43 computational cores, 21 IO servers, all the way up to 12 to one, which is 59 computational cores and five IO servers. 
And then blue is with no hyperthreading, and red is with four-way hyperthreading for the I.O. server. And what you can see, I mean, I suppose quite predictably, the actual I.O. overhead gets worse as we increase this ratio, but crucially, the fact that we have more computational cores at 12 to 1 is giving us much better overall runtime performance, which is the numbers above the blue bars, um, than um, a smaller ratio. Incidentally, I don't have value for 16 or 32 ratio because after 12, the I.O. servers became swamped and the I.O. overhead actually jumped about 500 seconds. So really, really bad runtime, I.O. servers swamped and, um, and that's not a good configuration at all. So certainly something that we need to find empirically and here, um, 12 is a good ratio. I mean, the last thing to say on this graph is the shared thing, which is an idea I had in terms of uh, running 64 computational cores, but then using the remaining three hyperthreads to do the data analytics for that specific core. And it goes okay, it's not bad, but it actually doesn't perform as well as a ratio of 12 to 1. So it was an idea I had, but it's not something I'll be um, pursuing any further. So thank you very much for listening. I've talked about our approach for in situ data analytics and IO, which is which is one of the modules on Archer and people are, are currently using. Um, we talked about the architecture, some of the challenges and lessons learned, and the performance and scalability up to 32,000 computational cores, which I think is reasonable. And now we're looking at pushing this to about 100,000 um, computational cores. So it'll be fascinating to see how this holds up to um, these, this uh, far increased scale. In terms of extra work, I think there's lots of opportunities in terms of the active meshing layer, really pulling this out of the I.O. server and maturing this as a separate, um, separate technology. And also maybe other things like Python to enable um, data analytics um, specification in addition to the XML. So thank you very much for listening. If anybody's got any questions, um, just shout out. Is it a requirement? So, yeah, so it's a very good question on bit reproducibility. Um, so I suppose there's two answers to this. In one respect, it's one way in which the scientist gives them a nice warm fuzzy feeling. So if we run it, and if we're, if we're, if we're um, strong scaling, and we run it on 100 cores, and we run it on 1,000 cores, does it give us the uh, same result? Um, but equally, you know, it does give some confidence if it's giving the same value at every single time. Um, and what we found without enforcing this ordering is the values were very, 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 very different. So it wasn't just a little bit different, it was super, super different, and it got worse and worse over time. So it did make us worried that there was something serious going on here. You want to put the output to Pavi directly? So yeah, so if you, so sorry, I'll very briefly just go back to my diagram. The initial way I designed the architecture was, you can see this NetCDF file writer is almost like a pluggable component and it works in a standard way, a standard connection to the writer federator. The idea being, well, we could unplug this and maybe put something in like an MPIIO or PowerV or something else um, directly. This would absolutely work. And um, if I'm entirely honest from an implementation perspective, um, I've cut a couple of corners more recently that sort of hard coded this a little bit more than I would like. So there's a tiny bit more extraction required from this. But this idea of keeping things separate was certainly an initial idea. And, um, and with this central architecture and our, um, and our general idea, that was the idea of being able to plug these things in directly. Um, and maybe there would then be some very interesting work in terms of sharing the data analytics between this diagnostics federator and maybe between Paraview itself, maybe Paraview could do some data, extra data analytics driven by the user's visual input or some feedback mechanism from the user's input back into the diagnostic federator. Again, that could be quite an interesting avenue for uh, further investigation. So, let us know if you've got any more questions, either for me or for Adrian. Um, if not, I would like to thank you all very much for coming along and dialing in. Um, all these will be available towards the end of the week uh, as videos.
you want to look at something in more detail. And I say, if you have any more questions, feel free just to ping us an email and um, chat to us offline about this.